Hi, and welcome to the Tomato Timer, a podcast about learning to learn. I'm Zubair from Xenos, and I'm tuning in live with experts from around the world, asking your questions and hearing their stories. All before the timer goes off. 24 minutes and 39 seconds to go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 18 of the Tomato Timer. And joining us today is an award-winning portfolio GP, a medical educator, an entrepreneur, writer, and a champion for diversity within the medical profession. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Patrice. How are you? I'm good, thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you for joining us. And can we just, I think, collectively, we would like to thank you and all the frontline workers, doctors, nurses, for all that you guys are doing and keeping us and our loved ones safe and and well. Thank you so much. No, that's okay. Thank you. (laughs) So I want to dive right in and just ask you how you're able to manage so many things while being a practicing doctor. You're running your own company. You are speaking at multiple places you are writing for lots of journals and stuff how how do you manage that and what's your work and like kind of work and social life balance so when i started um all the things that i currently do Mm -hmm. uh, i was taking a year out of my training and that's how i kind of got back into a lot of things like writing which i used to do a lot of okay so um when i was then i applied to the gp training program so i was working full time and it was incredibly difficult to keep up with all the things I was doing um so I would do a lot of things on the weekends and in the evenings and it would definitely be quite challenging and then since I completed my uh, GP training and become a GP uh, I cut my hours down so in a way I've reduced all my hours so I have much more time to do um all the other things and all the other interests alongside my medical career. Mm-hmm. So that's basically how I do it now. But yes, in the beginning, it was definitely difficult to balance everything. And I would obviously have to prioritize, um, you know, my career and prioritize my clinical work. So I wouldn't do things as, as much, but I would still, I would definitely keep them going, but just not at a massive or, um, yeah, a big rate. That makes sense. So we we want to understand how you finally, you got into all these kind of seems like many different kind of areas of it is a medical industry but in in many ways it's very different lots of people just focus on one and just pursue it much much further but it seems like you've you've gone in every different facet that was available um can you tell us like how all those ideas so what i have i have a portfolio career so that basically means you know what we've been discussing that i have a number of different careers and interests now I always wanted to be a doctor. I don't know if I'm jumping, if you have any questions related to that, but I don't know if I'm jumping ahead of myself, but I always wanted to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. Yes, and medicine was just always at the forefront of my mind. And when I started working as a doctor, I I wasn't, I feel like I wasn't prepared for the challenges and I wasn't, I was a bit disillusioned, I would say. Um, And I thought, you know, medicine wasn't essentially what I thought it was. So I took some time out and it was during that time out, I decided to kind of get back to who I was because during my foundation training, um, you know, you have to do a couple of years working in the NHS once you you graduate. I felt that I was working long hours and I was really burnt out and I just wasn't spending enough time with my family, I felt. So I really needed that time out. And it was during that time out that I you know, got back into things like writing. So I used to love writing poetry and I used to um, do that quite a lot. And I started doing that. And then um, I was reading some journals like the BMJ, for instance, the British Medical Journal and the BMA News. And there was my very first article actually I submitted was um, to the BMA News. And it was, you know, just about, um, if I remember correctly, about um, taking a year out of training and why I'd done that. And I remember the little ad was saying, you know, you can get paid for it as well. I thought, that's a nice, that's a cool incentive. So that's how it all started, really. So things kind of happened over time. And with my writing career, um, again, I write primarily now for GP Online uh, because, you know, as you can imagine, Mm. it's difficult to balance writing for loads of different places. So I just write for one organization now. And that started because I, again, I was writing to loads of places and then just submitting loads of of things. And I, I wrote an article for GP Online and they liked it. And then they took me on as a regular contributor. So things kind of happened like gradually. 
and I didn't I wouldn't say I necessarily had a plan for everything it was just again going back to discovering myself and my interests yeah so I would go back into school my, well I went back to my old school um in the beginning and you know spoke to students about my career and just kept you know going to schools and speaking and then I would just get invited you know loads of places I joined STEM ambassadors and again was speaking through there so things just kind of gradually um just yeah. played out really yeah could you share a little bit more about your time at school and how it how when you got to kind of medical medical studies and how that kind of training and all that as well where did the passion first come to you so when I was like four years old basically oh, wow. okay so I was very very young uh, I always wanted to be a doctor and I just remember always just being fascinated by medicine and I think from a very very young age I love learning like I just was always immersed in something a puzzle or a book or just something and I just love learning and yeah. when I when I found out or I discovered the medical profession. I, I, you know, I liked the fact that there was all this continuous learning and that um, I could acquire this learning and get all this knowledge and then use that knowledge to help other people. So it was a combination of that. And I think the passion just grew over time. The more I saw, I was always, you know, reading stuff and about medicine. I was always watching these documentaries and, you know, mm -hmm. these medical programs. Um, and it just, I just, the passion just kept growing and growing and everything I did just was geared up to applying to medical school and becoming a doctor. Um, so I went to a comprehensive school and it wasn't, it wasn't, it was an okay school. Um, yeah. but obviously like many comprehensive schools, they're not necessarily equipped with all the the tools, all the information that you need to then apply to a competitive um, program like medicine. medicine. Yeah. So it was a bit of a struggle, but I had a really supportive family and my parents helped me get some work experience and I did some volunteering, mm -hmm. I did some for a first aid course and I just did a number of different things just to make my application quite strong. Obviously, I had to get the grades and it was just a combination of all that and I got accepted um, into UCL, which was you know, oh, wow. my, yeah, um, like, <laughs> that was my dream come true. <laughs> I remember like in the summer before I started, I was, you know, looking at the, I was going online, looking at the, um, the website, reading all about you. Yeah. That's amazing. And uh, I feel very strongly now because you're part of my university. Um, so I just want to kind of give our audience a, a, a better insight into how, uh, the medical degree career works in the UK so once you completed your I think it's five years of studies then how does that how does the training work and then how do you finally become a GP okay so um when I went to UCL so it's a five the average duration for a medical degree is five years mm -hmm. now it could be more or less depending on obviously what you do if you're a graduate, if you've done a degree beforehand, then it might be a little bit longer because you obviously you've done three years or four years. Yeah. So as an undergraduate at UCL at the time, during 2007 when I applied, you had to, if you were undergraduate and you hadn't done a degree beforehand, you had to do um, a year out. You had to take a year out and do an intercalated BSc. So you had to choose a topic. I chose speech, science and communication, which is all about you know gesture and language and obviously communication. Um, and that was for a year. And then I went back to the medical degree, uh, medical program. So I did six years, uh, which was compulsory at the time. I think looking back, okay. I think it was good that I did the six years. But at the time, I didn't want to. I wanted to just finish. I wanted to do five years, and that was it. Was long enough, and I wanted to just do five. Yeah, I did six, but you know, it's great. It does help your applications because when you do in your final year, you have to apply for jobs. So you have to apply to go to a hospital and work as a foundation doctor. And every little bit helps. Publications, you know, and mm -hmm. extracurricular activities, and having another degree does definitely help as well. So at the time, I was like, okay, I don't really want to do it, but I can see the positives and I can see the benefits of doing it. And I'm glad that I did do it. So you do your medical degree. And once you finish um, yeah. your degree, you are a doctor. I often, you know, was asked, you know, when you finish, are you a doctor? And you definitely are. You've got your, your doctor, your title, you've got your degree or degrees. Um, so you apply to the foundation program. You're assigned a number of um, jobs. You have to take um, an exam. So if I remember correctly, I did a, a, an exam called a... SJT or situational judgment test and that goes um, and obviously the higher you score the better your chances at getting the hospital or the area that you want to work in 
I remember, I think I got my second choice. So that was in the Northeast area of London. And I worked at Whips Cross Hospital and South End Hospital for my second year. Um, and then at that point, I took a year Mm out. -hmm. Okay. And then I decided I wanted to apply to the GP training program. So again, I had to apply. I had to submit an application online through a platform, a website. And then I was invited to take a written test. Yeah. which I passed, and then I was invited to take the a practical test, um, a number of simulations. So you have to basically be, you, you take on the role of a foundation doctor and you have to interact with, you know, obviously actors, but they're playing the role of a patient or a relative and you have to work through these kind of dilemmas or these scenarios. And once you do all of that, then you're, you're accepted onto the GP training program, which is three years. Um, and then again, you rotate through different um, different jobs, different specialties, and just build the experience up. And then during that time, you have to do a number of assessments with your supervisor, who you're assigned to. And then you have to do formal exams. So you do another written exam called the AKT, Applied Knowledge, Knowledge Test. And then you do a practical exam called the Clinical Skills Assessment, which is the CSA. And again, um, it's just a, a practical. So you, again, you go through um, kind of cases, scenarios, and then you're marked by an examiner who's in the room. So, and then once you've done all of that, then you're a GP. <laughs> 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 all of that wow that was that's amazing and and i guess it requires so much perseverance to to go through every step of the way it, it, from from for me at least when i look at um my student my friends doing a medical degree it's like you already have a longer degree anyway and then just to hear from you all the <laughs> next steps that are left to, to do before you actually become a practicing doctor in the specialized field it, it sounds amazing but how do you stay motivated what's where does that perseverance come from I think we all want to be successful and I think for me I've always wanted to be a doctor and I wanted to complete my training so there was a point when I you know considered leaving medicine it was when I took my year out Mm. but I realized that I, the passion was still there and I still wanted to be a doctor and for me it's just something that has just always burnt inside of me and so that keeps me going I, I love interacting with people I love helping people I love learning And I love the variety and I love the fact that with medicine, there's so many different things you can do with your degree. You can travel, you can get into different areas. Like obviously I've got into writing, you know, there's so many things you can do um, and you meet so many different people, not just obviously your patients, but, you know, colleagues and, and your peers. Um, and I just think it's a really interesting career. So I think the fact that I've just, you know, I've been passionate about medicine, that's kept me driven and I want to Okay. achieve something and I want to leave a legacy So I think all those things are just constantly in the back of my mind and that kind of pushes me to keep on striving and, and wanting to do more and better myself. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And what would you kind of, I know that you've been interacting with lots of prospective medical applicants and successful medical applicants as well uh, through your company, uh, Dream Smart Tutors. How did that come about and what are the common trends you see among applicants and any kind of advice you have for us? So um, I started the company um, during my year out of training. So I did everything during my Yeah. year of training, basically. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and I started the um, I started doing smart tutors because, as I said earlier, I went to my old school, my com the comprehensive school I studied at, and I went back to offer my help and my expertise to the. young people who wanted to get into a medical career and um i found and by going to other schools and you know speaking to other students i realized that not for everyone because i don't want to stereotype i don't want to generalize Yeah. Mm -hmm. but there was a common trend that i found and it was i felt that the students i was speaking to hadn't done enough research For me, I felt that it was really important that they understood so much about a medical career, the good, the bad, the ugly, because, you know, I got to that point where I wasn't sure if medicine was even for me. And this is coming from, you know, someone who always wanted to do medicine, always wanted to be a doctor for them. So for them, for that person then to decide, actually, I'm not sure, should I leave medicine? I felt that the students who I was speaking to needed to really be informed. So I don't. I never kind of dissuade anyone. I never persuade anyone. I just give everyone the information and I tell them my experience and my journey. And then, you know, the students decide, obviously, if they still want to do medicine and how, and I support them with that process. 
So that's how it already started. And as I said, the main thing I feel is that young people need to do their research. Now, I know it's difficult to get work experience, but there are loads of other things you can do as well, like workshops and courses and just reading around. There are loads of things on YouTube as well, loads of day in the life videos. So I think when I look back at my time applying, I don't think there was as much, but I think now there's so much more um, you know, that the young people can use to research uh, a medical career. And I would just say that as we've established, it's a long path to <laughs> being a doctor and then specializing and then completing your training. So just really make sure that this is what you want. I know it's difficult. And if you find like me, you get to a point where you're not sure and you decide to leave medicine, there's no there's no shame, there's no problem with that. I think it's important that you do something that kind of that you know that makes you happy and that you are fulfilled by. And again, it is difficult to find that perfect career. Some people never find that perfect career. But my point is, it's okay to change careers. It's okay to say, well, I've done this for a little bit. And actually, I feel I, I realize it's not for me. And then to go on and do something else. So I think those are the main things I wanted to say about, about that. But yeah, research your career. Make sure that it's you. Make sure that it is you. Because sometimes I know parents or people might feel pressurized or pushed into certain careers. Absolutely, um, yeah. and it's difficult to obviously say no to your parents or you know, um but if you if you don't have an honest mature discussion with whoever you might feel is pressurizing you to go into a particular career then honestly when you'll be miserable and you may find that you're not going to persist and be as dedicated as you were if it was you so if it wasn't for me if it wasn't my own passion and my own want to do this yeah. i don't think i would have got even past the first kind of like month of medical school. <laughs> yeah, that, that it, it, the journey sounds truly long, arduous, but also very rewarding, I can imagine, at the end of it. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that having that kind of uh, the research and understanding of what, what it entails and what you, what you need to be able to do, but then what you can also get out of it as well, that the whole combination is such an important thing to have when you're applying to medical schools and and all that. Mm -hmm. So actually, I want to kind of move away from just specifically us and students and studying medicine, but talk about the medical profession in general, and talk about um, whether you've faced any discrimination, whether there, there's this lack of diversity, as, as you've shared with us. How does that, how has that happened? And what do you see kind of changing in that area? Is there an increasing uh, is diversity being increased in, in the number of applicants and number of doctors coming out at the end of it? Or is there still a challenge we're facing there? I think there's, there's still a challenge. Um, I think it goes for, you know, young you know, students from certain um, socioeconomic backgrounds. So, you know, they may not have had a, a parent who's gone to university. They may be having, you know, free school meals. So just not economically well off. Um, and then also from certain ethnicities, we know that there are certain ethnicities like you know, those from a Caribbean heritage like myself um, are underrepresented at medical school. Now, although the figures haven't really changed from the last time I, I looked at the, the figures, mm. they haven't changed or changed much. I think that there is more work being done to understand why there isn't um, this representation and um, what we can do to, to help. So I know there are loads of, you know, up and coming organizations. There's loads of widening participation activities to try and help. Uh, but I do think we still have a long way to go. In terms yeah. of discrimination, I, I, I wouldn't say I face any discrimination. Maybe that's because I've decided to go into general practice, which isn't as competitive as some of the other specialties. When I look back at my medical school career, or my medical school journey, sorry, mm -hmm. I don't think it was discrimination um, or overt discrimination. I mean, I suppose looking back, there, there may have been small things that I, I thought, might have been a little bit unfair or the way someone you know has spoken to me or said certain things or made certain jokes but for me like at school so at school when I go back to my you know comprehensive schooling I, I wouldn't say I was bullied but I didn't have a particularly great time in you know certain years so I think from like year nine to year 11 I didn't have the greatest experience but because I had that focus and that determination and that drive it didn't really matter for me yeah what people said or what they did or how they tried to make me feel. I just had that to hold on to. So it was always 
you know, I'm going to do this to get to, to where I need to be. And as long as I hold to this, I'm going to succeed and I'm going to do it. And I did it. So that's why I really think it's really important to have a focus. You know, I know it's difficult sometimes to find that focus, but if you can find it and, you know, you can research a number of different areas and maybe try and find one or just find something to hold on to, then that will definitely help. So, yes, there was, I suppose, looking back, some... I, I wouldn't even say... I don't know if it's discrimination is the right word, but um, there were some things that I noticed. But, as I said, I maybe because I had that experience from, you know, during my schooling, mm. I was I could deal with things much better. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. But that is very powerful, what you've said, in terms of finding that kind of inner fire and, and using that to kind of blaze through whatever challenges the world puts ahead of you um and i'm sure that's a very motivational thing for all our listeners to hear um i i don't like to because uh, we have almost every episode has to have some question to do with covid and with you being a doctor <laughs> it was it was impossible not to ask you um, and there are quite a few questions but i just wanted a kind of a general um response from you about everything that's happening or what 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 your feelings are and what we should be doing to keep ourselves as as one as one uh, listener asked to uh, keep ourselves sane and not start the purge <laughs> oh gosh where do i start <laughs> i will actually if i'm allowed to on my youtube channel i've done a whole video on how we can get through this lockdown so i hope you guys can check it out mm. um I think I'm not the most positive of people. <laughs> I, 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 people say, you know, there's like you're, you're pessimistic, but I, I would say I'm a realist. I, I'll say that I'm, I'm, I, I keep things very real. I'm very realistic about things. Um, I think in this situation, obviously there's a lot of uncertainty and we haven't experienced anything like this, but yeah. not just with this situation, but with loads of different things that, you know, young people that you guys will experience, you have to try and stay positive. Now, as I said, it's very hard for me to do i'm trying to advise you guys to do it <laughs> but it's really important so you know again if when i look back and i see myself obviously as a medic and a lot of medics we have you know this type of personality we're a perfectionist um and we want to make things you know perfect we want to get things right and life doesn't always work like that so yeah. it's really important that you know you you try and you be realistic you you, you know keep giving yourself these positive thoughts when you find that you have a negative thought you know recognize it acknowledge it and say how can i counteract this with a positive thought right now we're all stuck indoors we can't go and do anything okay well how do we counteract that thought well you know eventually this is going to be over and eventually we're going to see our friends eventually we're going to be able to do all the things that we weren't able to do so it's it's not forever and yeah. i think sometimes we just have to constantly do that and it's a for more, for some people, it's an uphill battle, and I suppose for a lot of us, and I know for me, it is every day you have to, con you know, consciously make that effort to stay positive and to be optimistic. And as I said, for me, it's not the no most natural thing to do, but if you keep working at it, then eventually you will find that it will be much easier for you to stay positive, and then you know you'll you'll find things easier in general. Mm -hmm. That that is really an important skill and trait to have in, in these uncertain times. And we'll be sure to link your videos for our, our listeners to also see. Um, the challenge with our episodes are always that, although the, the Pomodoro timer is a very good productivity technique, it always feels like it's a bit too short talking to some of you for those <laughs> interesting guests. So we're coming closer to the end. And as we do, we want to hear kind of like your final takeaway on all everything that you've experienced and all the different kind of career pathways that you have explored and continue to pursue um, and what you would say to us as I might not be 14 to 18 year olds anymore, but all of us out there who are kind of still in the, in the journey of learning and exploring new things. I would just say, keep going. Um, I do have a oh, dream so much. It came from a saying, which is dream big, think smart and always inspire. So, you know, have mm. a dream, you know, dream whatever it is you want to dream about. You you know, you can do it, but it's important to be realistic and to make sure that you have a plan. So if you feel, you know, you want to be a doctor, you know, and you're 14, how do you think you're going to get there? How, what do you need to do now so that in five years time or, you know, when you're applying, you will be equipped and you have all the things you need to make that happen. So please don't let mm. anyone tell you you can't do anything. Make sure that, 
yes, you have your dream, but you also make sure that you're realistic and you have a plan. And if you have that plan and you've done all your research and sought out all the help you need, then you will get there. And just to be persistent and to be positive. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Patrice. And it's been a pleasure having you. Sounds okay. Thanks for having me. Um, and thank you to all our live listeners. Um, we hope you'll join us in our next episode, which is in a couple of days. So thank you. Bye. And that's another episode of the Tomato Timer. If you'd like to ask your questions and join us live next week, join the Xenos Discord server. The invite link is in the description. And to learn more about Xenos and how a bunch of students are on a mission of making quality education accessible to all, go to xenos.org. Bye for now.